joint venture and uh, i'm happy to see our invited international speaker is uh, dr steve bird uh, dr steve bird has already been at lahore and uh, he has de delivered lecture a couple of times and uh, uh, today he's with, with us and he is uh, uh, teaching at uh, university of waikato and in new zealand and uh, he has done his postdoc at uh, university of aberdeen in uk and uh, uh, he he is he has extensively uh, carried out research in uh, the areas of uh, fisheries and aquaculture so today's session the session this session will be chaired by our respected vice chancellor professor dr asghar zadi and co-chaired by uh, uh, Shehzad Naveed sir, uh, Professor Dr. Asghar Zadi is Vice Chancellor of Government College University of Lahore, and uh, Shehzad Naveed is uh, the CEO of Altec Pakistan International. So, I welcome all the participants, and this is uh, uh, very happy to see that students, researchers, academicians, and farmers they are joining together us for this important moment, and uh, with the uh, so first of all, I would uh, I would request Steve Bird to if if you can start with your talk, so that we may not short short fall of time. Yeah, please. Okay. Steve, go ahead. You can share your screen and go ahead. Thank you. Okay, can you see that okay, Atif? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. And you can hear me okay? Awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much. It's always it's always a privilege for me to come and uh, share things with you guys. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I'm so sorry I can't be there in person. Um, things are difficult at the moment across the world. Um, but what's really cool is with technology, we can all come together and we can talk and share um, ideas, uh, especially around aquaculture, which is an area that I'm really um, passionate about. And um, it's really, for me, it's really cool to see what's going on in other parts of the world, especially um, in, um, in countries like Pakistan. And I totally realize and totally get how important aquaculture is to you guys. And so hopefully, um, uh, this will help um, in some way in, in kind of giving you some ideas as to where aquaculture is kind of going in the research area, um, both um, in the world, but also um, what we can potentially do um, in your country as well. So just to, um, to give you a little bit of background to myself, uh, some of you already know, but um, I was basically born in um, near to London and I moved to Aberdeen in 1992 to do my degree. Um, where I'm, and uh, so I moved quite a long way away from home and um, I studied at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, I was a student there for five years. And, um, and basically um, I went on to do my PhD there as well um, uh, for, a, for, a, for another four years. Um, after I finished my PhD, I, I, um, I, got, I managed to get a postdoc position at the Scottish Fish Immunology Research Centre. And um, what's um, um, cool about that is I got to work with uh, Professor Chris Seckhams, who some of you will have met. Um, he, um, he was my uh, PhD supervisor and he was my mentor for many years um, until I left to go to New Zealand. I learned a lot there. Um, the Scottish Fish Immunology Research Centre was one of the, uh, the top centres probably in the world for doing fish immunology research. Chris was one of the first to use new technologies to identify uh, genes and study them in fish. But in 2011, I decided that I needed a change. The weather was a bit cold in Aberdeen. So I uh, moved to New Zealand um, you can see it's quite a long distance away from where I was born. And um, 
I took up a position at the University of Waikato. And just to give you an idea about New Zealand and what it's famous for, um, if you don't already know, um, like, I, for, for example, if you if I came to Pakistan, I know you guys are good at cricket, so I know that, um, amongst other things. But what's New Zealand famous for? Well, it's famous for rugby and the All Blacks. So um, we they have a world-class rugby team here. Um, it's also famous for quite weird wildlife. Um, we have a lot of flightless birds here, um, mainly because New Zealand was very predator-free for a long period of time. So the birds learn how not to fly. And so um, it's causing a few problems now, but, um, but you have the kiwi, which is the, uh, the endemic bird of New Zealand. It's also famous for, it's got some very nice wildlife and uh, um, plant life. And so these actually are ferns, but they're actually trees. Um, so it looks quite prehistoric. And it's also famous for the indigenous people, which are the Maori people. And, um, and basically there's a lot of uh, culture and uh, especially within our research, we have to be very respectful of the indigenous culture that's here, um, especially when it comes to uh, using native species. It's famous for lakes. So there's lots of freshwater lakes around New Zealand. Um, interestingly, not many people eat uh, freshwater fish here. Um, it's mainly uh, seawater, but they have lots of lakes nevertheless. Um, which are, are very um, large and pristine. And it's very volcanic in certain areas of, the, of uh, New Zealand as well. So the North Island is very volcanic and has a lot of um, 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 active volcanoes and geysers um, that you can come and see. And also the thing about New Zealand that really is quite famous is the fact it's, foot, it's coastline. There's plenty of coastline around and uh, that's what lends itself really well to things like aquaculture. And so um, the coastline is uh, very well looked after. Um, it's not too overpopulated. And so there are many areas where people can um, operate um, farms uh, of uh, fish or even shellfish. So I'm based up here, um, just in Hamilton at the University of Waikato. Um, it's not far from Auckland and uh, I've been here since 2011. Uh, it's a small university, um, has, is not, uh, not too large, it's based around one campus. Um, there's a lake and you can see the buildings here are the university itself. Um, and as I say, it's, um, it's not the largest university in New Zealand. Um, um, Auckland and Otago are the largest. But it's famous and named after the Waikato River. So the Waikato River is this large river here that snakes all the way through the actual city you can see just here. Um, and again, it's a nice feature of, of the city um, that we have. So just give you a little bit of background about me if you didn't already know, um, but I'm really here to, to talk to you about some of the challenges for fish research in the future. And um, what I'll try and do is, is probably start off just by giving you um, an idea of why I study fish health. Some of you already have your own ideas, but I'll give you some ideas about me and, and some of them you'll be very obvious and some of them won't. So we all know that fish consumption is increasing. So you know from, from um, your own country that there's a big need for good quality protein and uh, fish is, is, is one of those um, good quality proteins that we can, um, that, we, we, that we're very good to eat. And you can see from this graph here that um, basically the consumption of fish has been increasing quite rapidly um, over the last 60, 65 years. Population is increasing, but uh, fish consumption is, is, is also increasing. And so because there's an increase in fish consumption, we need to be able to provide people with fish. And um, what's helping to do that is aquaculture. We can't keep taking fish out of the sea because that's causing problems. And you can see here quite clearly for this diagram, it's showing you that um, capture fisheries is green and in blue is um, global aquaculture. And we can kind of see that um, when we look at capture fisheries, capture fisheries has increased quite significantly um, since 1960s to 2012, but so has aquaculture. And you can see that aquaculture is almost caught up with 
um, um, capture fisheries. Um, if you look at those numbers in a bit in a bit more recently, you can start to see that they're they're still increasing. So this is from 2014. The statistics are slightly behind because um, normally they're a few years out because it takes a while to gather all the information. But you can see that that that, that uh, aquaculture is continuing to grow quite significantly, whereas capture fisheries is kind of slowing down. And that's really been the message up till now that capture fisheries is actually becoming a lot more kind of flatlined and almost decreasing in, in many places, whereas aquaculture is, is continuing to expand quite rapidly. And you can see here in 2016, again, the numbers have continued to increase, but you can see a good example of how capture fisheries is starting to decline. So the message here is that globally aquaculture has actually overtaken um, um, capture fisheries. And you can see from this graph here quite where, where this kind of happened. So um, what this graph shows you is um, the blue line is aquaculture for human consumption. And, um, and the yellow line is basically um, the total capture fisheries. And you can see from 1990 all the way up to, you know, to um, present day, things are pretty static. They're kind of flatlined. They're not really increasing rapidly. Whereas aquaculture for human consumption um, is basically um, increasing uh, quite, quite steadily, whereas capture fisheries for human consumption, which is the dark blue line, again, is remaining quite static. But you can see here that about 2012, 13, basically uh, aquaculture for human consumption actually crossed um, that line. And then what happened was again, in around about 2019, 20, so quite recently, what's happened is that aquaculture has actually overtaken total capture fisheries. And what we mean by total capture fisheries is basically it's not only the, the, the fish that are caught for aquaculture, it's fish that are caught for everything, that are used as byproducts in, in pet foods and in, in fertilizers and in fish to feed fish. Um, so basically, aquaculture is now overtaken capture fisheries completely. And this will continue to grow. It's projected to grow into 2030. And it's down to obviously population number. And so you, you guys there will be very aware that population is a significant um, issue. And uh, with a big population, you need to be able to feed the people that you have. And so um, it's very clear from some of these larger countries like China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, and yourselves, that because you've got massive it increases in population and in densities, we need to be able to produce food to feed people. Um, this just gives you an idea of how aquaculture is in some of these countries where it's kind of needed. And so I just kind of try to give you a snapshot of what's going on in the world. And so um, you can see um, uh, that in many, many parts of the world, um, here, here, I've actually put Pakistan on here right at the bottom. And you can see that this is your growth in aquaculture um, that's occurring. Um, so it's quite steady. Um, and obviously um, there's, a, there's a need for this to increase uh, a lot more. But you can see that in countries like Brazil, um, there's, there's quite a lot of growth. Um, it's interesting that in the US, there seems to be a downturn. And, um, and then in countries like Nigeria, there's also an increase. Um, there's a few other countries here as well. If, uh, the reason why I can't put them all on the same graph is it, it kind of pushes them all down. So if you look at some of these other countries, you can start to see that countries like India and uh, Indonesia, you can see that they're also um, increasing their aquaculture quite significantly. And that's projected to grow over the next few years. Um, and really the phenomenal one I find is China. If you put China on there, it pretty much flattens everyone out. And you can see how the growth in China is in, has, has grown significantly. But the message really is that aquaculture is required because we need to feed people. We can't keep taking fish out of the sea. And so to do that, we need to be able to understand the species that we farm and be able to farm them in a way that's sustainable, but also gives the fish good welfare and, uh, and allows them to be healthy. So to do that, Basically, we need to make sure we understand our fish that we farm. And so 
Um, doesn't matter what part of the world that you're in, what fish you're farming, what we need to understand is that every fish that we look at has a certain specific number of needs. And the trouble with our fish is that no one species can be a model for all. And so every fish that's used for aquaculture is highly diverse. And it's, it, I'll show you some examples of this later on, but the problem with that is that we need to be able to understand our individual species and we need to do specific research around those types of organisms. And each of our species has a very specific biological need. Some fish come from very hot temperatures, some fish come from cold temperatures, a high salt, low salt, um, all sorts of different environments that the fish live in, deep or in shallow water. And so what we try to do in our farms is we try to understand our fish and then match our farms to the types of environments that the fish are part of naturally. Um, that will allow us to grow them nice and healthily and, and fast. But one of the issues is it's not always possible to do that. And so what tends to happen is that most of the time, the fish that we're working with, we're farming them, they're in this thing we call a zone of tolerance where they're as happy as we can understand them to be, but we always need to do more research to be able to make them much more tolerant of the environment that we put them in. And that can mean changes in diet, in their um, environment that we put them in, um, in, in, in many different ways. And that's where our research programs come in. Um, and we need to be able to do those programs of research um, to, in order to understand our species. And there's four areas I think that most of us really focus on. Um, they're not the only areas, but they're the four that, that, that kind of are, are quite important when it comes to aquaculture. And this is health, stress, growth, and diet. And so when you're trying to farm an animal, um, pretty much you want it to be healthy. You want it to be stress-free as much as possible. You want it to grow optimally. And you really want a good diet. You want an optimal diet that's going to be able to allow that animal to grow um, properly. And all of these things, actually, when we do the research, they're all interlinked. Because if your fish isn't healthy, it's going to be stressed, it's not going to grow, and it won't eat. And if it's, if it's, if it's not growing, it's going to be under stress of some kind or some disease, or the diet's not right. And if you get the diet wrong, the fish will be stressed, you're going to affect its health, and it won't grow. So it doesn't matter which one of these things that we study, they actually are all interlinked with one another. And actually, I focus mainly on health aspects, but actually I've worked using health to look at things like stress and growth and, uh, and diets as well. So, that, so they're, they're, all, they're all quite important aspects of, of, uh, of um, fish aquaculture. And I've shown, I think I've shown you this picture before, but it's really important to understand our fish's needs when we farm them and, and when it comes to research, and so the, the problem you have is that, that the fish don't respond in the way that we want them to respond. So they don't always show us how they're feeling. Um, and so this, this slide here is a, to kind of give you an idea of if our fish could tell us how they were feeling, it would be really, really useful. But most of the time when we're farming animals, the reality is that when we've got them in the farmed environment, we don't know really what they're doing. Sometimes their behavior can give away certain aspects, but most of the time there's one of two options. One is that they're alive and one is that they're dead. And it can be very difficult in a farmed environment to, to look at individuals and understand what their needs are. Um, so that's one, one reason. So obviously understanding their health and, and, and developing their needs. Another reason I, I study fish is actually they are used as a model in some cases. So I've been involved in bits of work we're actually fish are now being used for human models, uh, a model of for human disease. And so zebrafish is a good example where it can be used to study diseases in, in, um, in um, um, humans. Um, the good thing about having a fish as a, as a model species is that actually anything that's found in fish actually gives us some clues um, within the fish themselves. And um, there are also a number of things, a number of areas where people are using the zebrafish as a model, which, which seem a bit, bit crazy, but, but people are using them to study things like irritable bowel disease or uh, skin cancer, um, deafness and things like that. So, um, 
So there are other uses for, for fish. Um, and this is an example of where they're using it for cancer um, as a human disease model. So, so that's another reason why fish are quite useful and I, I find them quite interesting. Um, oh, and this just gives you an example of how they're being used as well. So one of the cool things about zebrafish is you can, you can modify them genetically. So you can link a fluorescent protein to a gene that's being expressed. And this one's a good example. This is, this is showing you where the nerve receptors being expressed in the zebrafish. So everything that's lit up is nerves within that zebrafish. So it's a pretty cool um, way. Um, and this embryo is alive as well. So when you're imaging it, you can work on live organisms and see where things are um, happening. So it, that's, that's quite cool. So zebrafish is quite good for that. And it, this gives you an example of how you can link for different colored fluorescent proteins to different genes and you can study them simultaneously. So this is looking at retinal development in the eye of the zebrafish and different genes are linked to different colored fluorescent proteins. And it shows you that you can actually do this in real time and it's a very powerful model. So it's a cool model. Um, it's, uh, we need to understand our fish though. Um, and, um, and so one of the things that uh, I'm really interested in is understanding the health and, uh, and health is one of those key aspects of aquaculture and the research is there. So for the rest of the talk today, I'm just going to focus on a number of things. We're going to look at um, mainly on health aspects because it's where my expertise is. Um, and actually it's, it's where a lot of the problems occur in the aquaculture industry. Um, I'm going to look at some of the early gene discovery in fish, but then I'm going to focus on three main areas. One is genomics, and that's an area that's, uh, that's growing in fish health research. The next one's transcriptomics, which is, um, which is basically um, another area that's growing. I'm going to stop there and look at some of the challenges that face us in studying fish and, and the types of research that we do. And then I'm gonna end up looking at proteomics in fish health research. And so genomics and transcriptomics and proteomics, I'll explain a little bit about each, what each one of those mean when I come to them, but they are areas of research that are really opening up what we can do within our fish of interest. And it allows you to do research that can give you some real um, informative answers. And I think that's something that we've really struggled with over the last 20 years when we study fish is having the tools available that will enable us to actually come to conclusions as to how we can, we can farm our fish in a much better way. So um, if I just, my, my, my area was, was immunology in fish and immune genes and understanding the health in fish. And so um, one of the, things that I was involved in was trying to understand, you know, there's two main aspects of immunity. One is the natural um, immunity and one is the specific immunity. And so natural immunity is there um, basically to protect us from anything that tries to um, um, infect us is a first line of defense, will we'll protect us and prevent um, any organisms from having um, the upper hand. But then the specific immunity is there to come in a bit later to give us some kind of protection long term. And so these two types of immunity are really important when we're studying our fish and we have them in a farmed environment um, because they are basically um, the, the, the things that will fight disease and any types of problems that come along. Um, I've worked a lot on, on the molecules that regulate the immune system. So, uh, these things are called cytokines. They're just little proteins. And what they do is they signal between cells of the immune system. If we go back to the last space, the last uh, slide, sorry. You can see that within both the natural and specific immune response, there are specific types of cells that are involved in those responses. So in natural immunity, you've got these phagocytic cells, NK cells, and in specific immunity, you've got B cells and T cells. And so what these cytokines will do is they get released from those types of cells, but they will communicate with cells of the immune system to give you the right type of response um, towards any type of pathogen or, or stress response that the, the organism is having. So when I first started, there was very, very few methods out there. This was 20 years ago. 
I started looking at the immune system of fish. And um, what we found was there were, were limited approaches that were available. So we used things like homology cloning, cDNA libraries, express sequence tag libraries and subtractive hybridization libraries. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about those. If you read any of the early papers, you'll see those types of uh, methodologies there. Um, homology cloning was one we used quite successfully. And all that means um, is that you basically, um, you take genes that are known. So at, at the time when I was um, starting out, um, the, this is uh, TGF beta. This is, a, this is one type of gene found in different organisms. So you can see here, there's uh, trout, human and shark. The way homology cloning works is really you align sequences that you have information for, and then you just design primers in regions where there's high homology. And so this was very successful in being able to um, design some primers and do some PCR to amplify up genes from a particular um, um, region. And so this, this is all homology cloning involved, taking sequences that we knew about and aligning them. And it works really well here because you can see that uh, from human to bony fish down to cartilaginous fish, there's high levels of homology. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't work for every, every gene that we work with. And actually, it tends to not work in most of the cases. We were just lucky with some of the genes that we focused on, or some of the immune genes that we focused on, that there was this high level of homology. But in many cases, we don't have that. But um, what happened was using these types of approaches, it allowed us um, by 2002 to have had a whole range of cytokines um, have been found or immune genes that have been found. And you can see that within bony fish, um, like trout, common carp, zebrafish, halibut, sturgeon, eel, place, and so on. There was a range of genes that we were able to find using this idea of homology cloning. Um, and also a whole range of um, um, other cytokines known as the interleukin-1 beta family. So what it shows you is that the early research was quite tough. It, it took a long time, um, especially to find genes uh, that we were interested in so we could study responses in fish, study the immune responses, study how fish could actually fight disease. Um, and it only succeeded in identifying what we call slow evolving genes. And what I mean by slow evolving genes is genes that haven't changed much over time. So like that gene I showed you before with the sequence where you've got the shark and the trout um, and the human, they haven't changed very much at the, the, at the nucleotide level. And so um, these were slow evolving genes, mainly genes involved in the innate immune response, interestingly. So that first line of defense that's there to protect us from anything that tries to invade. Um, and as I said, this is a good example of um, that this is actually the, 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 amino, the amino acid sequence of that gene I showed you earlier, showing you that there was nice regions of homology um, at the amino, amino acid um, sequence. So that's why that approach worked, but it was slow. Um, it did allow us to find a number of different genes, um, but one of the problems with that is that it just took a long time and it was expensive as well. So this is now when I'm going to go on to look at some of these other new technologies because um, these are the things that have really opened up what we can do in our research, uh, especially within um, aquaculture. And so genomics is, is one of those areas and genomics is, is basically an area that's grown over the last probably 10 to, 10 to 15 years, quite significantly. Um, Interestingly, if you looked at what was in the um, database in 2013, this was all we had as far as genomes go. So we had cartilaginous fish, a, uh, an amphibian, a bird, a reptile, and we had a range of fish species, pufferfish, um, zebrafish, madaka, stickleback, but this was all we had. Um, interestingly now though, um, with things increasing, and so this is basically giving you giving us an idea of how things have increased as far as sequences go. You can see here 
that um, things started off pretty slow in the 80s, but you can start to see that with new technologies like whole genome sequencing, you can see that there's a whole new range of um, um, se sequences becoming available. So this is showing you that in the databases, there's a whole, there's a whole range of, of information now becoming available. And we now have, well, in 2017, we have a lot more fish species that are available. So this was at the state of the database in 2017. And you can see there's been a big expansion of the number of fish species where genomes are available. And these are good genomes. So you can see there's, there's representatives from many fish species. Um, interestingly, in, in 2016, there was another paper that came out that actually sequenced another 66 genomes of fish. So there's a lot of work being done. And there's also another um, whole range of uh, genomes becoming available through databases um, as, as well. So, so really the message is that there's a whole um, number of genomes now being sequenced. Um, if there isn't a genome there for your own species, there's a related one and they can always help as well when it comes to trying to work out what you want to study in your own fish species. Um, and it's all down to the fact that genomics has become cheaper to do. Um, if you look at the human genome, the human genome, when it was first sequenced, um, it cost three billion US dollars. Um, a human genome now will only cost you about a hundred US dollars. And the, the human genome, when it was first sequenced, it took uh, about 15 years to produce the first draft, whereas now you can do it within a day. So things have really changed a lot. And that's why we're seeing more and more genomes becoming available. And the cool thing about genomes, and this is the recent um, database that I went to and I was able to get more. So you can see that it, as well as all these other genomes I've been showing you, there's now a whole range of other, other fish, another 36 fish species where genomes have been added. So it's becoming really significant and uh, it allows us actually to do some very cool research. The way it helped me was basically by having a genome, it just made finding the genes that you're interested in and to study a lot easier. So if I show you early research that I was involved in back in the 90s and early 2000s, you can see um, this is the number of publications. And it can, you can see very clearly that early on, there wasn't very many publications around immune genes in fish. And you can see that they started to grow um, up until about 2002. This here is showing you when there were the major discoveries made for certain cytokines. So you can see it's quite slow. About one a year was occurring. So it's very slow progress trying to discover what genes were available. However, genomes for fish started to come in about 2002, 2003. And then what happened was there was a significant number of, cy of cytokines and immune genes were found. And so you can see that it went from finding one gene a year to finding multiple genes. And so what this allowed us to do was discover what's there as far as the immune system goes. And then it would allow us to do interesting research around those genes to enable us to, to understand how our fish are responding within um, any farmed environment. And so, uh, I just added another thing here, transcriptomes. Um, so transcriptomes also became available around about 2011 and 12. But you can see that with these discoveries, with genomes and with transcriptomes, you can see that there's a continual growth of um, the publications and the research that's being done. And it's all down to the fact that there are these advances in the technology that allow us to do very cool research around these species. And so what really genomes opened up to us was it helped us to identify fast evolving genes. So genes that do change a lot over time. And so interestingly as well, many of those are involved in adaptive immunity. Um, one of the theories behind that is because, you know, um, there are certain organisms that try to hijack your adaptive immunity, but adaptive immunity actually changes faster or has evolved faster to kind of stay ahead of the pathogens that try to hijack it. So a good example here is this gene here, interleukin-6, which is another cytokine, but you can see 
what I mean by fast evolving, uh, fast evolving genes. If you look at human, trout and shark, there's very little similarity between them, but they are the same gene. And we know this from a number of reasons, um, from some of the motifs that the gene has, the, the protein has, but also from its expression and where it's found within the genome itself. So overall, genomes has allowed us to discover quite a lot of stuff. Um, we found a number of immune genes now. Um, that means it just opened up a whole avenue of research because we can use each one of these genes and we can study them in the context of the fish in the farmed environment. So if the fish is on a different diet, if the fish is under a disease of some kind, if the fish is um, stressed in some way, we can study these genes and we can understand how they're regulated and it can give us a really good understanding of how those organisms are acting and responding in those environments. And one of the things that we've kind of got from genomes is that when we look across evolution and we look at vertebrates um, as a whole, jawless and jawed vertebrates, um, so all vertebrates that are on the planet, what we find is things like the innate immune system are very similar. And that makes sense because if you think about it, many of the genes have evolved quite slowly. However, when you look at things like adaptive immunity, what you find is that many of the components of adaptive immunity really only came about um, during cartilagin cartilaginous fish. And so the, the components that we have for an adaptive immune response, you can only find as far back as cartilaginous fish. But having all this information means that we can now take our animals and we can study them and understand their responses in very informed ways. So that's genomics. But another area that's been, and genomics has helped us in understanding um, what's there in fish. The problem with genomics is it does take a bit of time. And, and, and also you can only study one gene at a time once you've found it. Transcriptomics, on the other hand, is a very, very powerful uh, tool for allowing us to study many genes at once. And so um, what I mean by transcriptomics, it's basically all the messenger RNA or the RNA transcripts, sorry, that are expressed in a cell at any given time. So what we can do is instead of looking at one gene at a time, we can look at thousands of genes that have been expressed all at once when a fish is under any kind of um, stress or disease or different diet. And then what we do is we use certain tools like bioinformatics to understand that data. So what we're doing here is instead of looking at one gene at a time, we can actually look at everything that's going on and we can look at pathways and we can look at how all the genes being expressed to get a really good understanding of what's going on um, inside our organism when we are farming it. We use next generation sequencing, which is sequencing that's been developed to be able to do this. Um, the technology is called RNA-seq, so you'll see papers that talk about RNA sequencing. And what it does is you take a set of cells or tissues from the organism and you extract all the RNA transcripts and you sequence them all. So you don't bias anything that you do, you sequence everything that's there and you can show all the genes being expressed at any one given time. So it's almost like a snapshot of everything that's going on inside that organism all at once. And the cool thing about this technology is actually for your species of fish, if you have no research that's been done before or no genetic information, you can, just, you can just start things from scratch. You can do quick gene discovery. You don't need to understand your fish. You just take the RNA, sequence it, and you can understand things about your organism very, very fast. And so what you can do is you can do expression studies with no prior knowledge. So you can take a species where nothing's been done before, you can put it under different treatments. You can take your controls. You can take your um, treated fish and you can do RNA-C and you can actually look at gene expression with no prior knowledge. It's a very powerful tool. To show you how this worked, I did it on a, a native species here in New Zealand, a yellowtail kingfish or Seriola landi. It's a species that they wanted to farm here. 
Um, it's part of the New Zealand big game fishing industry. It shows you how big these fish can get, but they're wanting to use it um, as an aquaculture species. And so to use it as an aquaculture species, they wanted to understand how these fish are responding to certain types of um, um, diets or treatments. And so using next generation sequencing was a, a good approach. There's nothing's been done before. Um, the approach that we used um, basically was this approach called Iron Torrent. I'm not, I haven't got time to go into details. There's many different platforms you can use to do next generation sequencing. Um, but all it does is generate a lot of sequence data. So the idea here is it shows you um, that um, you have a large number of sequences. So this is the number of sequences that you generate. So 34,000 here, but this is the length of the sequences that you generate. So on average, they're about 150 base pairs. So on average, 150 base pairs, um, but 34,000 of them are that, that kind of size. But overall, you generate about 3 million reads. So it's a lot of information. So obviously to understand that, you need to use um, special tools. Um, and so um, using bioinformatics, what you can do is you can take that sequence data and you can put it together using bioinformatics and you can start to understand what tools are available. And what you, what you find is that this was using a fish species that had never been looked at before. And using transcriptomics, these tables here are just showing you the amount of, of genes we were able to find and this was just taken from a tissue, um, I think it was spleen tissue, um, that um, had not been, it was just normal spleen tissue, had not been stimulated in any way, not been treated in any way. It just shows you the range of genes that you're able to find um, using this approach. So quite a large number of genes. And what that means is that once you have a new species that you're trying to study, we can use these very quickly now to monitor the fish's response to changes in its environment. So that just gives you an idea of those tools available. Um, what's interesting is we can use these tools and we're using them now in some of the main aquaculture species in New Zealand. So in New Zealand, if you don't know, the main species that are used here are king salmon, mussel and Pacific oysters. So these are the three farm species. And um, there's very specific regions around um, mostly in the south, you get um, the salmon being produced, and in the north, it's mainly the shellfish due to the, uh, the differences in temperature. Um, this gives you an idea of the Marlborough fish farm, um, what the, some of these farms that we have. So this is a king, king salmon farm um, in New Zealand. Uh, this, is, this is a seawater one, and this is a, a one that's in a freshwater um, in Canterbury. Um, Interestingly, though, we've been asked to look at some of these um, species, these, these fish. And so we've got a project at the moment that's using some of this next generation sequencing. Um, there's a few issues that we have with um, um, the king salmon. Um, some of them are undergoing quite big problems with deformities. Some are having quite big issues with disease. And so we're using next generation sequencing and transcriptomics to understand them. And what's really interesting is that because of all these new technologies like genomics and transcriptomics, we now have um, um, quite a large amount of information at hand. And if you go back to 1992, what was interesting in 1992, there was only 97,000 sequences deposited. These were gene sequences deposited in the database. And only 19 of these were actually taken from fish. Okay, so that's quite significant. 1992, only 19 sequences taken from fish. But now, basically, um, in 2019, um, what you have is 24 million sequences. So these are gene sequences. These are from different species from all around the world. And so you can see there's been a, a massive increase due to the fact that we have genomes and transcriptomics available to us. And as I say, this helps us in our research and allows us to overcome the hurdles of understanding our fish's needs. Now, I'm just going to finish off with a couple of things, really. One of, one of them is the challenges that we have in fish research. And one of the biggest challenges we have is that obviously fish are very diverse. And fish have, have refined their immune systems. 
They're the largest group of species across the planet, the largest group of vertebrates. There's 33,000 different species. Um, and there's many different ways they can achieve disease resistance. And so what we tend to find is actually when we try to understand fish health, then um, we have issues because there's lots of differences to what we have found with mammalian immunity. And uh, the other issue that we have as well is that fish actually um, have more genes than we do. And that's because um, all fish have undergone um, another round of genome duplication um, compared to, um, compared to uh, mammals. So all bone, bony vertebrates, when they were de developing, went through two rounds of genome duplication to give us what we are today. But all teleost fish have gone through a third round. And what that means is that you can have double the number of genes in fish for some genes, not all genes, but for some genes. And then if you're studying salmonids and some carp species, then there's another round of genome duplication that's taken place. So this is another challenge because when we're studying different genes, one of the issues is we need to make sure that we're studying all the genes that are relevant. Um, here's an example of some papers you can go and look at if you haven't heard of this before. Um, so there's a number of different papers that talk about immune gene duplication or gene duplication in fish. And you can see here, this diagram highlights it very nicely. So as I say, here is where um, you've got genome duplication in most vertebrate species. Uh, no, in the early vertebrate species, then you can see fish, teleosts have undergone a third round, and then salmonids have undergone a fourth round. And as I say, it just complicates things a little bit because fish can have duplicated genes. And I'll show you an effect, I'll show you an example of this. Um, we were studying uh, one, one um, family of genes, the tumor necrosis uh, fa factor family, super family in fish. And uh, what, uh, one of them that we study is TNF alpha, which has many different roles and is important for understanding um, immunity um, and, and innate immunity. Um, if we look at fish um, and what they have, then it's quite complicated. So this diagram here, what it shows you is it shows you how um, some of the members of the TNF superfamily are arranged on a chromosome. So this is human chromosome six. Here's TNF superfamily one, two, and three. And it's actually number two, that's TNF alpha. And it's showing you that some of these other genes around it. So th this is basically a chromosome and the genes that you find around it. If you look at reptiles, reptiles, have uh, one of these members of the, 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 the TNF superfamily member. But the interesting one is actually frogs. So frogs actually almost replicate what you have in um, mammals. So they have one, two, and three, one, two, and three here. And then some of these other genes um, you also find around it, like this one here and this one here. So we call this syntony, where the, con where, where the order of genes in a genome are conserved. It's known as syntony. And so you can see between Xenopus, um, the frog and the, the, the mammal, it's quite good conservation of this gene order. But it's this one here that we're really interested in. This is TNF alpha. Now, if we look at zebrafish, zebrafish on one chromosome actually has a copy of TNF alpha and this other one here, this TNF superfamily member three. However, what tends to happen is that on another chromosome, we find another copy of this TNF alpha family member. And this is all down to the problem with genome duplication. So what's happened is in fish, where there's one copy of a gene um, in, in mammals, there can be two copies in fish. Now, not all genes have two copies, but you have to be aware that they, they might do. And so you can see here very nicely that this one um, does have two copies. And actually, if you look next to it, you've got this gene here, GABR1, you've actually got um, a, a, co a copy of it right next door to that one as well. Now, the issue you've got is you've got two copies. So which one is more important? Or are they both important? Um, do they have the same role? Or do they have different roles? And so that's one of the issues that we try to work out. And so um, if we look at um, these two genes. So I showed you the zebrafish ones, and here they are, one and two. 
you can see that actually in a phylogenetic tree, they're not right next to each other. So they do split apart. The sequences are quite different. But it's not only zebrafish that have two genes. Actually, most groups of fish also have two genes as well. So there's group one and group two of these TNF alpha genes. And so you can see in salmon and trout, there are, there's two copies. Actually, just to make things more complicated, I told you that salmonids um, have undergone another round of genome duplication. That's why if in trout, you've got one, two, three copies. So this just makes things more complicated. But if you stick to the fact that there's two copies of um, genes in fish, so within um, these groups here, you've got two copies, and within the cyprinid, you've got two copies. Um, what tended to happen, and just keep that in mind, because what tended to happen is people early on, before we knew there was all these issues with two copies, people started to study the, the activity of these, these proteins. So they made the recombinant protein, they studied the activity, and what was interesting is when they looked at the activity of these proteins, they didn't agree. So the work that was done in trout, the work that was done in sea bass, and the work that was done in carp, each one of these proteins that was made using the so-called TNF alpha gene, they weren't the same. The, the activities weren't the same. And at the time, people were arguing that there might be something wrong with the research and so on. But interestingly, now, when we look at what we know about genomes, what you find is if we look at these three genes and we look at where they are on this tree, what you can see is that the carp gene was here, the sea bream gene is here, and the trout one is here. So the fact that there were different activities being exhibited by these proteins actually now makes more sense because actually they're not the same genes. They're actually from three different groups and so what needs to be studied is another trout one in here. And so the trout one here is probably gonna have a very similar activity to this one here. And this sea bream one um, that's, that's gonna be down here will have more activities there. So this is the issue you have to be careful of. And one of the challenges that faces us when we study fish, that they do have these multiple copies. And then really the other issue you've got is that they don't always have all the genes that we expect to find, be aware, that just because we understand immune immunology in, in mammals doesn't mean we're going to find all the genes in fish. And also there's a novel group that exists and these, um, the, the, and this is a good example here is the Poseidons. So these are the kinds of things to think about when you're looking at fish and fish research is that not everything's going to be the same. There's going to be duplicated copies of genes. There's going to be novel genes and there'll be some genes that you don't even find there. And just for the last few minutes, I just want to just finish off by looking at proteomics. And there's not much to talk about with proteomics because we don't really have the tools available to us to do proteomics in fish. And that's because the tools uh, are quite expensive to make. So with proteomics, really, that's the study of proteins. So really, at the end of the day, what we want to study is proteins. And proteins gives us really the definitive answer about how responses animal animals are responding to different types of uh, disease and stress um, we can study messenger rna but the problem is that the protein production doesn't always match mrna production um, if you look at the problems as to why we don't have the tools it's because most research is done in human and mouse um, so we've got many lots of genes have been identified and discovered in mouse and human but we still need to discover quite a few in fish um, and if we look at the type, the amount of research that goes on in fish research compared to mammals, you can see it's relatively small. That's why we don't have the tools available. When you've got a large community of people working together, then you have more tools available to do the work. Um, one of the things that we have been doing, though, just to kind of give you some ideas, is that we have been developing some of these tools to do proteomics, and we've done it to try and understand adaptive immunity. And so what we've done is develop tools, antibodies, or molecules that bind to proteins that allow us to understand what those proteins are doing. And so we can target particular proteins on the surface of cells to identify them. And one of the, one of the ones we've targeted is, is this one here, CD4. Um, in the adaptive immune responses, you get different types of T cells, but we want to identify 
those T cells by identifying some of those proteins that get expressed and CD4 is, is expressed specifically on the surface of T helper cells. Um, you can also uh, target T cell receptor and CD8 um, as well. So if you have T cell receptor and CD8, you can identify cytotoxic T cells. If you have CD4 and T cell receptor, you can identify um, T helper cells. Um, and if you have CD3, that's also another marker. And so this gives you an idea that there are there is work that's done to identify antibodies that allow us to try and identify different cell types within adaptive immunity, but it's slow work. Um, the problem is, is that it's expensive to develop antibodies and uh, we don't have many of them available in fish at the moment. And the ones we do, um, we, we still need to validate. Um, one of the things is, uh, is we've been trying to develop antibodies to other markers as well, so to B cell markers. And so um, there are B cell markers available, so IgM, IgT, and, and CD5. Um, so you find these things here. So on human cells, um, you find lots of these CD, CD markers and immunoglobulin markers. So people have started to identify some of these on fish. So there's a number of different papers here. And so what we can do is if once we've got antibodies, we can start to identify and understand what's going on with these fish species. The problem is it's expensive. And one of the things that I've been involved in over the last um, probably eight, uh, eight years is trying to develop some of these tools. And so my, myself and a friend in the UK, we started a company and we're developing tools that allow us to do this type of work um, to, um, um, to proteins in fish. Um, basically, we call it vertebrate antibodies. Um, basically, there's myself and my, and my two colleagues here um, that, develop, that are developing these antibodies. And there are a number of different antibodies available. Um, obviously, we don't focus only on fish, but we do have a number of fish ones available. Um, if you go to the website and you can see that there's some to salmonids, carp, zebrafish, tickleback, and some shark species. And, um, and basically, oh, one of them that we worked on, one of, one of them that we developed um, actually within zebrafish was this one interferon gamma. And so what we've been able to do is for the first time in fish, we've been able to um, basically monitor and study protein expression of an immune gene when an organism is undergoing some kind of change in its environment. And that's the first time we've kind of, you know, that is one of the first times we've been able to do this with a, a fish antibody specifically designed to do that kind of work. Um, we've also been able to look at, if you treat this different cells um, with some immunostimulants, you can start to see how the protein gets expressed differently after a number of different hours. Um, and, um, and so, really at the end of the day, one of the things we want to do more of is produce these antibodies so that we can start to do much more research based around protein expression so we can get a much better feel for what's going on inside our organisms of interest. So in summary, um, there's a lot of challenges in, in, in research when it comes to aquaculture, um, mainly because we don't have the tools available. Um, we, we understand a lot about fish health now and we understand a lot about some of the, the things that are going on. Um, there's many biomarkers we can use to understand our species of interest. Um, we can use the biomarkers to understand um, the effects of things like disease, therapeutics, immunostimulants, stress, toxins in the environment. Um, we can get a good idea about how our fish are responding at the molecular level, at the gene expression level. Um, and then we're, we're developing new technologies now and tools that are allowing us to have more informative investigations in our fish species. But there are a lot of challenges. There's a lot of things that we still need to do to understand our fish species. Um, and so uh, over the next uh, 10 to 15 years, one of my jobs is to try and develop more of those tools so we can use them to better understand our fish species um, in aquaculture. Thank you. Sir, please unmute yourself.
ji thank you very much steebert thank you it was a very interesting talk and uh, meanwhile our uh, session chair has joined us professor dr askar zadi vice chancellor government college university lahore uh, we welcome you sir uh, and uh, uh, now the house is open for the discussion if you have any questions you can please raise your hands we'll turn your mic on and then you can uh, ask the question acha uh, atif uh, let me just first apologize that i had to it's one of those days when you realize that your time is not your time uh, you can't do things you like to do uh, but you have to do other things uh, so i'm i really apologize i really wanted to be part of this uh, session even convinced atif that i should be co-chair uh so that i i i have good reasons to be sparing time for it turned out um, the boss is calling i have to leave in few minutes to meet the governor who is our chancellor as well and earlier there were other meetings which i could not skip you know so my apologies i really wanted no to know more fisheries uh, can, and culture can i have a uh, just for your interest of the audience can i have a few words for Professor Asghar Zaidi Sir, uh, he is the fourth Vice Chancellor of GC, Government College University Lahore and the thirty-first uh, head of uh, this institute, and he is an alma mater of uh, uh, University of Oxford, uh, International Institute of Social Studies, Kaidar University, and he is an old Ravian. He has studied at this very institute as well. He has got, uh, um, he has been granted with many awards, uh, uh, and he is a social po policy analyst. Uh, by research on thank you, Atif. thank you atif thank you so much steve thank you so much for your uh, very interesting talk uh, thank you to other um, speakers of this session today as well as other the speakers who would join um, uh, in the following two days uh, i'm also very thankful to dr atif for organizing this doing all the leg work behind is it still called leg work when you're organizing online conferences um also dr ayub who has been instrumental in in um giving us lots of reasons to be talking about fishes uh, and aquaculture um we are really very fortunate that in our new uh, campus we have a whole stream uh, a full a natural stream to think of many different experiments and many different forms of research on fish um and and undertake other aquaculture uh, research so <clears throat> this is a very timely uh, conference because it it will give us inspirations that how do we go about using that resource in our new campus uh, which the, the sky is the limit there uh, so very timely what i would request if at the end of this two days three days conference if you could draw a a synthesis a summary for a, for a layman like myself that uh, what have we learned from this conference and and what does it tell us moving forward uh, that would be extremely welcome and and we will put it on our web page uh, and and it would be extremely useful Uh, for our uh, other purposes, for the purpose especially for our new campus uh, work. So thank you once again. Uh, my apologies that I could not co-chair this session. I would try to join other sessions at some other occasion, but today, uh, unfortunately, I could not spare more time. Thank you, Mr. Thank, thank you, you very much for sparing your precious time. Uh, so with your permission can you proceed with the next uh, talk all right so uh, i would now uh, invite uh, dr mohammad ayub he is a president of pakistan fishery society he is also a senior visiting faculty at at department of zoology cotton college in lahore he has uh, been uh, director general of the department of fisheries government of the punjab for about a decade or so and uh, he has been at that department for several decades and 
before that he did his uh, phd from uh, usa and uh, his extensive services uh, in the uh, area of aquaculture fisheries and allied disciplines have been uh, renowned to all of us and dr ayub has uh, also been uh, uh, the ceo of uh, uh, infofish at uh, malaysia which is a fao organization so ladies and gentlemen uh, i would now request dr mohammad ayub to pr proceed with this talk uh, thank you dr atif yakub uh, my special thanks goes to professor dr akhtar asghar zaidi vice chancellor dcu and also uh, to altec for co organizing uh, this uh, uh, online seminar you know people have started calling mostly webinar so today uh, uh, what i will be talking about uh, the the what is the outlook for aquaculture so uh, let me start sharing the screen uh i hope you can see my screen dr atif yes sir we can yeah if you can go ahead with okay. the uh, yeah. slide show uh now before before i start i would uh, again uh, mention what when the vice chancellor said about the the possibility of having research facility at the new uh kalasha kaku campus obviously this uh is a very good uh, this is going to be a very very good uh, thing for the research and development of fisheries and aquaculture in pakistan because the, uh, we uh, have a very very unique uh, opportunity to develop uh, a really a world class research center and uh, uh i believe in the leadership of uh, current vice chancellor we would be able to establish a really good research and training facility at our new ksk campus as uh, mentioned by vice chancellor we have freshwater stream and we have a drain also where we uh, if when we develop the research ponds we would be able to gravity drain all those ponds which is a uh, big uh, uh, advantage so uh, before i start uh, my talk just few things about the importance of the fish uh it's uh, called as nature's superfood why we call it nature's superfood uh because it can train all the essential elements like uh, vitamins calcium omega 3 fatty acids vitamin d iron oid iodine and one of the best sources of protein etc uh again uh, talking about the importance of fish in nutrition it's an excellent source of omega 3 fatty acids and uh, specifically epa and dha ecosa pentaenoic acid and docosa hexaenoic acid so what these two omega 3 fat fatty acids they they are for what they do uh, we will see at the later uh, at the bottom of the slide so fish is important for optimal brain and neural system development especially in children and it is also mentioned that it is very important to include fish protein in the diet of the pregnant women so that the the child development and especially the the brain of the child is developed in a normal way 
So uh, fish is good for CHD. It lowers the risk of coronary heart disease. And a daily intake of 250 milligram of EPA and DHA, which I mentioned above, Ecosa pentaenoic acid and docosa hexaenoic acid, uh, 250 gram, 250 milligram per adult gives optimal protection against coronary heart disease. So it is recommended that uh, we should take two meals per week. Now coming to what are the challenges? On the left, we see that our resources are going down. They are decli declining. And what are the reasons? Overexploited fish stocks, IUU fishing, illegal, unregulated or unreported fishing, overcapacity in fishing fleets, degraded environment and ecosystems, climate changes and post harvest losses. And then on the other hand, there is increasing population, economic development and increased consumption. So when I say increased consumption, it is due to increase in population as well as increase in per capita consumption of fish, as I will show you later on in the statistics that uh, per capita fish consumption is steadily increasing over the years. So by the way, uh, the statistics which I will quote is the published, latest published FAO statistics. Uh, this uh, table gives us the total fish production, both from capture fisheries and, and uh, aquaculture. Uh, let me, yeah, see it gives a comparison from 1986 to 1995 and up to 2018. Uh, on the top is the captured fisheries and captured fisheries include both inland and marine. Inland from freshwaters like rivers, and marine from sea. And uh, the total capture production in 2018 was 96.4 million tons. And while we look at aquaculture, there is a major share of inland fisheries that riverine and inland aquaculture uh, is producing 50, 1.3 million tons of fish, while marine aquaculture is producing 30.8 million ton of fish. So when we combine capture 96.4 and 82.1, which is aquaculture, so total production from both capture and inland during 2018 was 178.5 million tons. Uh, I would also like you to have a look at the human consumption or per capita consumption. So in 1986, 1995, it was 13.4 kg per capita, which has increased in spite of the increase in human population to 20.5 kg. So it means uh, our per capita fish consumption is increasing. And it has been shown that this per capita fish consumption has a direct relationship between the per capita income of, the, of that particular uh, area or that particular population. So there is a general trend that as the per capita income increases, the per capita fish consumption also increases. And there is another relationship between the, the health awareness and per capita fish consumption. So as awareness about the importance of white meat and especially fish consumption goes up, the per capita fish consumption 
uh, goes up as well. So I would just uh, like to uh, give a brief, you know, glimpse that during 2018, the fish exports were valued at 164.1 billion US dollars. So this is a this is a very huge amount. So fish exports uh, are increasing every day. I mean every year. So I will show you uh, later that uh, what is the status of different countries, what are the major exporters, and in the later part of my presentation, I will also discuss the situation in Pakistan. And we will also see where our exports, they stand. Uh, global fish production has increased at an average of 3.1% from 1964 to 2017. So this production 3.1% increase in production has been greater than our population growth rate. So global population growth rate during the same period was 1.6%. So there was a net uh, surplus of fish available for human consumption. Uh, during this period, all other animal protein production, that is meat, dairy, milk, etc., grew at 2.1%. So while fish and aquaculture, it grew 3.1%. So there is uh, uh, more growth in fisheries and aquaculture. And that uh, global trend continues. And that is probably also, we will see, uh, that trend also holds in case of Pakistan. So from 1961 to 2018, the per capita fish consumption grew from 9 kg to 20.5 kg. The contribution of world aquaculture to total fish production has reached 46% in 2018. So as was mentioned earlier, the, the, the capture fisheries is almost static or is going down while aquaculture production is increasing and that is the global trend and by the way that trend also holds true in case of pakistan so in aquaculture there is a major share of inland aquaculture and marine comes later and in, in inland also there is increasing role of uh, or share of shrimp, crab, and crayfish. Uh, uh, so the, 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 the shrimp in production is increasing as is the case uh, of our neighboring uh, India. India has also increased its shrimp production tremendously. Same is true for Indonesia. Same is true for Thailand and Vietnam. In Pakistan, I will mention later, we have just started uh, a shrimp production, especially the freshwater shrimp, which we have introduced in Punjab. And there is uh, some shrimp fish farming in private sector as well. So this figure shows uh, that the marine, this orange, color is the marine capture fisheries, which you can see from late 80s or 90s is almost static. While at the bottom uh, is the, the dark color is the inland capture fisheries, which is also just giving a marginal increase over the years. But the real growth is in aquaculture. Uh, this uh, shows the top 10 global capture producers. And notice that China is way ahead of any other country. China, which is followed by Indonesia, Peru, and India. So China is one of the major captive fishery producers. And the similar trend also hold 
uh, for uh, aquaculture. So these are the inland water capture, top 25 inland water capture producers. Why I'm showing you this slide? Because when we look at global statistics, especially the FEO statistics, we very rarely find mention of Pakistan. And why it is so, I will mention uh, later when I will specifically talk of Pakistan. But this is one of the very rare tables where Pakistan is mentioned. And if you notice, it is at the bottom of the table, which is at 19th position. And uh, see, in 2018, our production from inland capture fisheries was only 0.14 million tons. And uh, what are the other 25 countries? By the way, uh, see Indonesia and India, they are, India is uh, after China and Indonesia is also, uh, uh, Bangladesh is followed by India. Uh, this is the same table, the rest of the countries I'm and uh, I have continued it from Pakistan onwards. Uh, so this is the where Pakistan stands. But another very interesting fact, which I want to show you in this table, is that Asia is the dominant in capture, and later I will show you also in aquaculture. So 66% is contributed by Asia, 25% by Africa, so it is generally said that Asia produces and rest of the world consumes the fresh and aquaculture products. Uh, this is uh, different uh, aquatic groups, which is uh, produced uh, uh, from 1990 to 2018. Now I come to the projection. What are, what are the future projections which are very important uh, especially for uh, uh, new businesses, new enterprises. And we are very fortunate that Pakistan uh, now is attracting, you know, companies like Altec, which are investing in uh, research and development and which are uh, introducing uh, good quality feeds, which is a prerequisite for development of fisheries and aquaculture in the country. Uh, this is very important projection. Uh, up to 2030. And I would just uh, ask you, so this is the, the projected demand of fish in 2030. Total millions of ton and total fish production. And the, I will just focus on the last column, which is showing the supply and demand gap by 2030. So this minus 104.7 shows that by 2030, we would require 104.7 million tons of additional fish. So it is a good incentive for new entrepreneurs or young uh, entrepreneurs to come into the business because this would hold a promise in future. And I will also show you the projections up to 2030 of the prices. So I always uh, ask my graduate students that they should not only look for uh, jobs in private and public sector, they should also become entrepreneurs. And when we come to pa Pakistan, we will see that there are, you know, there are several unexplored frontiers where young entrepreneurs can come. So this just, this one figure is a big incentive for new entrepreneurs to, to come into the business. So by 2030, 
world would require 104.7 million additional tons of fish and fish products. And by the way, notice that the biggest gap would be in Asia, minus 78.5 million tons. World capture fisheries and aquaculture production. Uh, again, see aquaculture is steadily growing while capture fisheries is static or going down. So the projection is that Asia will continue to dominate the aquaculture sector and will be responsible for more than 89% of the increase in production. So major production again in future is expected to come from Asia. China will remain the world's leading producer. Its share in total production will decrease from 58% to 56% in 2030. Overall aqual production is projected uh, to continue growing on all continents. <clears throat> this is annual growth rate of world aquaculture from 1980 to 2030. So 80s was the decade when there was highest growth rate or more than 10% of growth, annual growth uh, rate in aquaculture. And by the way, that was also true in case of Pakistan. We also witnessed about 12% per annum growth in aquaculture production, aquaculture growth in Pakistan. But over the years, this growth is slowing down. And now it is about 3% or a little over 2% uh, in 2020, expected to be more than 2%. Uh, in case of Pakistan, it has also drastically, the growth rate has grow, uh, gone down drastically. Uh, I may not discuss the reasons here because uh, we have limited time for this uh, seminar, but uh, we can discuss at some other time what are the reasons. So coming to the prices, prices are expected to rise up to 2030. The, with the expected slowdown of aquaculture production in China, prices would further escalate. Demand is expected to increase due mainly to increase in per capita income, increase in population, increase in prices of other meat, increased consumption in developing countries, increased urbanization, and improved distribution and processing. So these are some of the uh, uh, reasons why prices are expected to increase by 2030. So global prices of fish are expected to go up 22% by 2030. And this increase would also be due to increase in the prices of the fish feed or the fish meal, 30%, which is expected to increase and fish oil prices are expected to increase 13%. And similarly, per capita fish consumption is expected to grow one kg from 20.5 to 21.5 kg by 2030. The expected per capita growth of fish for each region by 2030 would be 9% in Asia, 7% in Latin America, America and 6% in Europe. Uh, now I will talk about uncertainties and especially the recent FAO OECD survey done about impact of COVID-19. So this survey was carried out uh, by asking regional fisheries and research organizations so this survey is based on the regional fisheries and uh, organizations. So the first is, is the impact of COVID-19 having or expected to have negative consequences on the management of fish stocks or on the production and management of aquaculture? 
So 91% of the response was yes. Only 9% was no in case of captured fish. So in case of aquaculture production, 100% yes, that is COVID-19 is going to expect aquaculture management and production. Now looking at fisheries research, is the impact of COVID-19 having or expected to have negative consequences on the research on fish stocks? So 79% responses were yes, 21% responded no. Uh, very interesting about the fisheries prices. Owing to the impact of COVID-19, has the price paid for fish been affected? So in case of captured fisheries, 27% said the prices have decreased and 36.5% said prices have increased while 36.5% said don't know. And in case of aquaculture, 36.5% said increased and 36.5 equal amount said decreased and 20, sorry, 36.5% uh, said decreased and 36.5 said don't know and 25, 27% said increased. Other uncertainties include environmental issues, disease outbreaks, IUU fishing, changes in tariff and trade rules. Now, a quick look on Pakistan. Doc, Dr. Atif, I suppose uh, I can go out for 10 more minutes? Yes, I think so, yeah. Because okay. we have to, we have to be, we have to get some time for discussion if there is any. Okay, okay. So I'll, I'll, I will just quickly go to Pakistan. Right. Uh, in case of Pakistan, when we compare with the neighboring countries or in the region, we are not doing very good. Uh, that will be supported by the statistics in terms of uh, fisheries and aquaculture production. And I always uh, mention the, the policy issues. The number one policy issue, as far as I understand, is at the federal government level, one subject, fisheries and aquaculture, is split into two ministries, which is very, very unique, probably nowhere else in the world, we can find this happening. So the Natural Food Security, the Ministry of Natural Food Security and Research actually should be looking after this uh, fishery and aquaculture subject. So they are looking after fisheries development board, while the most important component, which is the fisheries, marine, uh, sorry, fisheries development commissioner is under the Ministry of Ports and Shipping. And uh, resultantly, the Marine Fisheries Department, which is responsible for the research and development of the whole, uh, our uh, marine and coastal areas. By the way, we have almost 1,500 kilometers of our coastline. So all this major subject is under the Ministry of Ports and Shipping. So this split in, uh, at policy level at the federal government is hampering the, the development of this sector in the country. By the way, this happened after the 18th Amendment. Before the 18th Amendment, the, the whole subject was under Ministry of Food and Agriculture. So look at uh, this statistics come from, uh, again, Ministry of Food Security. See that from 2013, 14 up to 18, 19, our marine production, I would say is almost static. There's no considerable increase. 470,000 metric tons in 2013 and 498,000 metric tons 
in 2018-19 and target for current year were 504,000 metric tons. So in case of inland fisheries, also there is no substantial increase, 265,000 metric tons in 13-14 and just 301,000 metric tons in 18-19. So remember that the, the earlier statistics, the FEO statistics, which I showed you, they were uh, in million tons, but these, this, uh, this particular table is in metric tons. Uh, sim same is the case uh, in our exports. This is in metric tons. See, exports are almost static over the years. And these are the export earning 369,000 metric tons in 1314 which increased only to 439 million US dollars. Sorry, these are US dollars. These are metric tons and these are US dollars. So just to give you a quick uh, comparison with India, for example, their exports are almost or around 6 billion US dollars, while we are only 439 million US dollars, our exports of fisheries and aquaculture products. Bangladesh is also almost 2 billion, or more than 1 billion US dollars. So in case of Pakistan, one of our major uh, uncertainty or issue is again depletion of our natural stocks. Uh, these pictures show uh, one of the biggest reported Tor pitutora or Mahashi specimens. So we don't find such big specimens anymore in our natural waters. Uh, in breeding at our hatcheries, these are two views of uh, our hatchery. By the way, this at the left is the intensive fish seed breeding facilities. We, we have two such facilities uh, here in uh, our province where uh, uh, at the uh, the second floor, algae, pure algae is cultured and that algae is fed to the rotifers on first floor. And from first floor, these uh, rotifers through this pipe are fed to the fish fry at the ground floor. So we have these two facilities, but there is a widespread in breeding at our hatcheries. Then aquatic pollution, destruction of our breeding grounds, high cost of input, no or very little coastal aquaculture. So by the way, this is again, almost uh, unexplored frontier for young entrepreneurs. They can start uh, this uh, uh, unexplored uh, uh, frontier of coastal aquaculture. And there is a big demand as uh, I have shown all over the world for uh, uh, fish and shrimp uh, products. Then lack of uh, certification, although we have established uh, uh, ISO certified uh, state of the art fish quality assurance lab, but uh, the certification is yet to be started. And it is very important to uh, certify our fish products to make them acceptable in the international markets. Inadequate processing facilities and uh, almost lack of a uh, modern and hygienic fish market, which is nowhere in the country. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I suppose I have consumed my time. And uh, back to Dr. Atif. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for very interesting talk and uh, the I think we may have some questions from the audience. Uh, there's a chat. Uh, there's a, there are some questions in the chat box. If I could speak out, and uh, like for example, Asia is the most populous continent on Earth, so it se seems non-logical that major gap will be in Asia. 
Bilal Masood. Bilal always made very good observations. Bilal, uh, the reason is that the population concentration is also highest in Asia. Population growth rate is also highest in Asia. Uh, and also, there is a rapid development of uh, middle income, uh, increase in middle income growth in Asia. So as, as I mentioned, where, as the income grows, so per capita fish consumption also grows. So traditionally in Asia, even it is true for Pakistan as well. Those countries which were traditionally just exporting fish have started importing fish also. So Pakistan is also now importing considerable amount of fish. And some countries over the years have become, in Asia, I'm talking of Asian countries, over the years they have become uh, net importers. So I will just uh, stop, don't go in, I, will go, I won't go in further details. All right. Any others? The production will also be there. Think of this as well. I suppose uh, Dr. Steve is also there if there is some question uh, for us. Dr. Steve, I'm also available. Dr. Steve, if you would like to go ahead for some questions. Dr. Atif, if you could please read read the question so we can answer. There's a question if locally if local demand is greater in Asia, so how can we go for the exports? Yeah, that's uh, that's again a good question uh, because the, as a, if you remember, I also showed there are uh, specific statistics which uh, I couldn't show in this uh, presentation. Uh, about 80 to 90 per ninety percent of the global aquaculture production comes from Asia. So this is the reason. Uh, there's another question. Uh, kindly state the recent status of cage culture in Pakistan. Dr. Abir from Multan. Well, uh, cage culture is getting popular and uh, presently the federal government and the provincial government is also giving incentive for development of cage culture. Uh, we started uh, experimental work about seven, eight years back on uh, cage culture in Punjab. Uh, some of the initial trials were not successful. Then we have uh, uh, subsequently have uh, started it doing in uh, uh, small dams in Potohar region of Punjab and some of our trials were successful. And now, uh, government is giving uh, incentive subsidy to the private sector for uh, development of cage culture. And I suppose uh, it is uh, now going to develop uh, quite rapidly. Although I very strongly believe that uh, uh, in, in, in our local situation, we cannot go as far as in cage culture as some countries which we look as model like Indonesia, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and some other countries. There are uh, certain uh, specific reasons for that, which I believe I cannot uh, discuss here. Uh, there's one question about the uh, fish health and disease. Uh, are, there, are there any measures being taken to mitigate this disease uh, incidence? Well, uh, there is a public sector capacity, uh, although it is not very well developed, but there is a capacity. The Fishery Research and Training Institute in Lahore, Manawa Lahore has a pathology lab. And then uh, they have some uh, uh, divinal sub laboratories as well. But luckily, since at the moment, we are primarily doing semi-intensive aquaculture. There are very, very few uh, progressive fish farmers which are entering the realm of intensive aquaculture. So as long as we are in, in 
semi-intensive aquaculture, the incidence of disease is very, very low. So we are fortunate in that sense that the disease incidence is very low and we don't have uh, any major outbreak of diseases as we, we witness in some other countries like there is a catfish outbreak usually taking place in USA. Then there was a shrimp disease outbreak in starting from, from uh, Vietnam, it spread to Indonesia, to Malaysia, Thailand and other countries, even it came to India. So we, we are fortunate enough that we don't have such outbreaks as yet in Pakistan. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for a wonderful discussion. And uh, now we proceed with the, uh, I would invite uh, our co-chair of the session today, uh, Dr. Shehzad Navi Jadun. He is basically a veterinarian and uh, he is a nutritionist. And uh, then he got his uh, business studies from Ireland and came back to Pakistan. And he has exposure of 21 countries. Uh, and uh, he uh, is running as, as CEO, he is running Altec uh, Pakistan Private Limited, which is an Irish based company. It's uh, uh, set up is in Pakistan is he's running this and uh, his major contribution probably I would say is different from the uh, traditional uh, 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 he's making his company is probably different from a traditional setup because he uh, is working with the private public sector and he believes firmly in the interaction of academia research along with the uh, with this industrial development. So I would I would now invite uh, Dr. Shahzad for his comments, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Atif Jakub and uh, Professor Dr. Asar Zaidi uh, Vice Chancellor uh, GCU Lahore. And uh, many congratulations to everyone who has arranged uh, this online uh, session because I think this is an advantage that we have taken and this is an opportunity for all the young uh, professionals and the stakeholders to come and listen and learn and share what they are thinking of. Of course, the idea of uh, uh, this session is like that uh, we have to think uh, globally and act locally. Based on that, we have invited our uh, international speakers and we have taken the advantage of inviting our more prestigious and learned person, uh, Professor Dr. Yakub as well, Ayub as well, sir. And uh, uh, I think today's theme was uh, the outlook of, outlook of aquaculture. And uh, this fact is very prominent that uh, one side we are having growing population and on the other side, we have the growing demand of the food. And of course, uh, fish is a future protein. This is a well-established fact and we have seen the data and stats from different organizations which has put across that the capture fish is going down and the aquaculture is growing up. So which means that there is a bigger opportunity for us. So once we talk about the science, the ultimate goal is that we have to tabulate that business in according to the science uh, technology developments and new innovations. So as Steve Burtz has uh, given a very good talk on the uh, on genomics and on the uh, uh, genetic improvements of the fish, of course, this is the first line of defense because uh, being a nutritionist, I do believe in this fact that nutrition and the genetics go side by side and we have to work on a bottom line, which is profitability and performance. So there is uh, a lot of uh, improvement needs uh, to be done on that. And before that, we need to point out what are the real time challenges in our industry. For example, once we talk about the health, we talk about the nutrition, we talk about the management, we talk about the processing, all these things. Uh, all together give us an idea that where we have to put our uh, R&D sense. For example, as you mentioned, Alltech being a leader in animal nutrition, and of course we are the second largest producer of feed in the world. So we, what we are doing by having our presence in 128 countries, we are picking up the problems, real time problems from the industry and then process, process them through our collaboration with different R&D institutes and then come up with the solution. So likewise, uh, I'm, uh, we are thinking and we are trying to work over here. And of course, uh, uh, Professor 
Ratif has given a very good platform. And uh, as uh, uh, Steve Bird also mentioned about the facts that we do have the biomarkers, we do have the nutrigenomics development, we do have the gene impressions we can uh, study through nutrition and we can study through different aspects. So these are the areas uh, we can work over. And uh, I'm thankful to Steve Bird for giving uh, the talk on this uh, area and uh, putting a light because right now we are in progressing phase and this is the area we need to set our stage right because if we put our direction right then we can achieve our goals and uh, of course uh, i'm always thankful uh, and it's always a pleasure to listen uh, to dr muhammad ayub saab because he is a he's a real time uh, experience not only only for pakistan market but he has a vision for the global market so of course when we look at the stat these this is an obvious fact that we need to uh, synergize ourselves. We need to think locally and act locally. We need to compile and group up uh, our professionals. We need to give chance to our uh, youngsters and to the new entrepreneurs. We need to create the public awareness and we need to create those nexus which can uh, improve and all those things has to be the, uh, you know, the private challenges led base because everything which we are going to invest in the business that has to be validated by science. So I'm thankful for uh, Dr. Yu because he also mentioned the growing demands and the need of the R. So we need to equip ourselves with those things. And uh, uh, again, uh, I'm very thankful uh, to be part of this uh, session today. And I'm sure we have a very interesting uh, two days coming more. So uh, uh, thank you very much once again for giving me opportunity. And uh, I must uh, appreciate and thanks to Again, to Steve Birch and uh, uh, Dr. Mohammad Yu. Thanks, uh, Dr. Atif. Uh, Dr. Atif, can I say something? Yes, sure, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, before uh, you know, ending, I would like to extend uh, 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 you know the on behalf of Pakistan Fishing Society, which has uh, professionals and. Uh, uh, technical experts all over Pakistan, all out help to Professor Dr. Asghar Zaidi, Vice Chancellor at DCU, in establishing the state of the art uh, research facility at KSK campus. So, Fishery Society would be willing all out to help in any way we can. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, I hope that uh, this partnership of Pakistan Fishery Society. Uh, DC University Lahore and uh, Altec Private uh, Private Limited. This is this will go a long way in this sector, I'm sure. And uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, check out with the, the session chair, Professor Dr. Askazadi, if he's here, sir. Do you you have a minute, sir? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, he has uh, multifarious engagements today, and uh, there were some high-profile meetings with uh, our vice chancellor. So, on uh, behalf of our vice chancellor, behalf of uh, the Department of Zoology and Senior University, I am grateful to all of you. And here's an announcement from Pakistan Fisheries Society that their membership is open, and uh, they are getting uh, their members enrolled on subsidized rates for life membership, for uh, fellowship, and ordinary membership. So I think the uh, the organizers would uh, be contacted. They can be contacted just in case if uh, anybody is interested. Because by tomorrow, I would uh, hope that the Pakistan Fishery Society officials would post their uh, membership form here as well. So thanking you all. And have a nice day and see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Bye -bye. sir. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.